here with Megan Coder, who is the Chief Policy Officer for the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. So thank you for being with us today. Digital therapeutics is a big topic here at the Congress. So Megan, let's start from some basics. I know that one of the most important points about talking about digital health and so on is to make the taxonomy right. So can you explain the difference between digital health, digital medicine, digital therapeutics for our audience. I would love to. So in general, digital health is everything that fits under the broad ecosystem. It could be everything from wellness to diagnostics. Uh, it, but anything that's digitized in the healthcare ecosystem is basically digital health. Um, under that then sits under that umbrella, digital medicine. And those are things that are used more broadly. So it's something that's mostly regulated, doesn't have to be, um, but those are going to be your diagnostics or other forms of digital biomarkers or me monitoring, measuring, some things of that nature. Then digital therapeutics, we are the subset of digital medicine. So they all fit underneath each other. Um, and when I talk about digital therapeutics, we're talking about software that is actually intending to directly treat, prevent, and manage a disease or disorder. So that's the really big differentiator. It's not human-driven, it's actually software-driven. Right. So do you feel that, uh, no, obviously we have been talking about this for a few years now, not many, but a few years now. Do you feel that the audience is mature enough to understand, or when you talk, you still feel that there is some you know, area where the concepts are confused and so on? We've actually seen quite a bit of growth. So when we first started this, um, digital therapeutics had been on the market and approved by the FDA, for example, for at least 10 years now. So we have a full decade's worth of experience. But when I started the Digital Therapeutics Alliance in 2017, there's still a lot of questions around, what are you talking about? What is this thing? Now, for those who were really trying to focus on the decision makers, policymakers, payers, it's a very commonly understood term, which is wonderful. Right. However, getting down to the clinician level and the patient level, that's a different story yet, right. where we're still really needing to do a lot of work on that front. So what is specifically the mission of Digital Therapeutics Alliance? Yeah, so from the onset, our goal has really been to help create that foundation for this industry. So what is the definition, the taxonomy you're speaking around? What are some of the core principles that we believe all products should align with to make sure that they're legitimate and valid? Um, and that has evolved quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, now in the United States, for example, we are working with uh, individuals in Capitol Hill to talk about let's create a benefit category for these so that patients with Medicare Medicaid uh, on the public paid side of the ecosystem can have access to them. Right. Um, in Europe, we have a European Policy Coalition. Um, in Asia, we're working on similar ideas. So it's really been an international focus, really trying to lay the foundation for this whole industry. Right. So you feel that, you know, if you talk, obviously your, your reach is global, right? How do you feel, um, I guess, U.S. is at the forefront, uh, Europe kind of in between? What, what is your feeling, particularly between uh, Europe and U.S.? Okay. So I would say that there's different tiers of advancement taking place. Um, in terms of the United States, the payment, especially from the private side of payers, PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, uh, different payers and employers, they're further advanced. However, when it comes to policy, Europe is further advanced, in my opinion. Right. So when you're looking at what Germany has done, what the UK has been doing for the last couple of years, what France is in the process of doing, Belgium and the Netherlands and Finland and Estonia, we're seeing a lot more movement across Europe from the policy side, right. which is fantastic. But again, the commercialization side, I'd say US is still ahead, but uh, there's still a lot of evolution on both sides. So talking about Europe, as you yeah. mentioned, obviously there is still you know, different countries at a different stage. Uh, who is at the forefront? And since we are in Italy, you know, tell us more about where Italy sits in all this okay. environment. So I would say the UK was the first one to lead off. They were the first ones to ever say, based upon the level of risk your product has, therefore these are the types of health economic outcomes you need to have and clinical outcomes for your product, which is pretty revolutionary from my perspective. Uh, that said, it's still just harder ecosystem because you still have to go with and negotiate with each of the individual ICSs within the country. So unlike Germany, where there's a pathway that exists at the national level and you get national access, the UK, you can get a national recognition, but you don't get national access. Right. So that's been a challenge on that front. Uh, when we're seeing different ecosystems like Belgium, they have a pathway, uh, but very few have reached the top of that pathway to get the reimbursement. Uh, 
So you've seen things of that nature. And then other countries are really working to build up their ecosystems right now. Uh, but again, it's more of a policy thought leadership perspective than it is a full access um, commercialization across the country yet in right. many ways. And in terms of Italy, what do you think are the, you know, the biggest hurdle for a, for a wide adoption of this? I would actually give a lot of shout out to the healthware team uh, who's really been working with the Italian right. uh, ecosystem. I haven't seen a national level decision made, but we've been talking with different policymakers and regulatory agencies, and there's not only interest, but I think there is some movement. Uh, I don't believe they're as far advanced though for down that road as Germany is with their ecosystem and France is with theirs. So you're starting to see more there. Spain is another one where I'd love to see more taking place at that level, but uh, there is still more regional. Uh, in that regard. So talking about numbers, how many digital therapeutics are around in different stages, uh, which particularly from a yeah. European perspective? I wish I knew that number. Okay. That'd be a great number to know. Uh, at this point, since the definition has not really been finalized by regulatory agencies or recognized within different frameworks like the softwares and milk device framework that was created by IMDRF, uh, it's really difficult for us to know the exact number. I would love to know that though. Okay. Um, right now, one of the things that we're doing within DTA is I'm working with ISO, the International Standards Organization, to create that definition of what a digital therapeutic is. Right. Hoping that more will be able to adopt it from a regulatory standpoint, and then we can finally really get to understand that ecosystem. Like, we know our membership of DTA members, but even then, we know there's a broader ecosystem of who's really using that, who isn't, and how it's being used. I think there is a lot that, there needs to be some more evolution in that area yet, too. Right. Now, this morning you raised uh, an important point I think is crucial, which is when you started, you said that obviously the clinical evidence was kind of based on pharma criteria, but now probably you are moving to a fit-for-purpose criteria. So I think uh, I want to have your view on this and how we are going. And this was a surprise to me. It's something that when we first started, we were expecting it to be more around when you're looking at how do you evaluate the efficacy and output of a digital therapeutic right. and the health economic outcomes, it just made sense in our, most of our heads that it would just be pharmaceutical based, just use the same pathways. But as our conversations developed, we realized that that wasn't the case. And uh, it's the idea where we can start to build on some of the pathway requirements that exist in the pharmaceutical space and in the traditional medical device space. But realizing that digital therapeutics, they do have a different life cycle, they do have different iterative approaches, they have different outcomes, and there's different ways about achieving those outcomes. So to just use the pharmaceutical pathway and apply it to DTX, we realize doesn't actually make as much sense as we first thought it would. So we're seeing that evolution emerge, and now the question is how do we actually build that out, how do we formalize it, and really start to help payers more globally understand and, okay, this is what I need to look at for clinical evidence efficiency. Right. Uh, what is sufficient? Do I need to s ask for more studies? Or else, actually, this is a good amount. I feel that I can take on sufficient risk with this. Let's move forward with a patient access perspective. Right. As opposed to, I'm not sure, let's just do another RCT to be safe. Um, and then that doesn't lead to any access for patients in the end anyways. So one hurdle which I think would be a very important one from a regulatory perspective is that obviously regulator I used to say, okay, this is a drug which, you know, is safe and, eff and effective yeah. and that's it. But the drug stays the same for, for a long time. And I'm a pharmacist, that's, so I'm very familiar with this model. So the software doesn't do that, obviously. It so, does not. So how do you feel this? Is, uh, to, to me, this seems really like a big hurdle to overcome. It is going to be an interesting hurdle to overcome. I'll agree with you. Uh, I think part of what we're looking at here is just that initial approval. So is it safe and effective? That is just a baseline. Gold standard still is the randomized control trial. So we're not moving away from that. Right. But as we're looking at, I think more of that payer perspective, that localization, how do I know it's going to work for my patients in the northeast or southwest of the United States? How do I know it's going to work for my patients in Belgium if the study's been done in Austria? Right. So how can we start to look at Yes, you have the clinical trials to demonstrate its impact at one level, but then you could also then look more at those notions around, uh, do you need a localization pilot? Is there something else you can use that isn't always just another RCT? Um, building on some of those requirements is gonna be, I think, a lot of discussions. Uh, it's not just gonna be a mandate saying this is how it is, uh, but we need to start really getting people this idea that there's more to this than maybe just using what we've always been using. So, Megan, thank you for being with us today. Congratulations for all the achievement of uh, Digital Therapeutic Alliance, and you know, good luck, obviously, thank for you. the future. I look forward thank to work you. with you too. Thanks. Thank you.